So I thought I would do at least one example of a perfectly elastic collision of a ball with a uniform rod. And we'll take the rod to be pivoted at one end. And since it's uniform, things are going to be fairly simple. We don't have to integrate to find the moment of inertia. It's just a standard result. So an elastic collision is a collision that conserves energy. Now, unless I've told you, you should never assume that energy is conserved. But in this case, I am telling you up front that energy is conserved. Well, that will allow you to do two things. First of all, we can find what happens after the ball hits the stick. If it's heavy, it could go in the same direction. If it's light, it could rebound. I'll just draw something for the sake of drawing it. And then the stick or the rod for its part will swing around and go to some angle theta, momentarily stop there and then swing back. Now that part I'm not too interested in. Once I have the angular speed, I can figure out using energy conservation of all the kinetic energy of the rod transferred to potential energy and I can use the pendulum geometry like I did in the previous problem. So that's not too interesting to me. You can find the angle theta if you so desire. But in this problem, what I am mainly interested in is describing the subsequent motion of the ball after the collision and the rod just after the collision. So let's first ask if linear momentum is conserved. It actually is not because, as we saw in the previous problem, upon impact, there's going to be a reaction force on the pivot, Fp, and that means that there is in fact, net external force in the x direction. So let's first write down what's not conserved. Linear momentum, not conserved. Since the sum of forces in the x direction is not equal to zero. Angular momentum is conserved, especially if you take the angular momentum conservation about this pivot point. You notice that the impact force goes directly through the pivot point so there's no torque and the gravity also goes right through the pivot point so there's no torque so angular momentum is conserved because the net torque is zero in the z direction. So the sum of the initial angular momentum in the z direction about the pivot point is equal to the sum of the angular momenta in the z direction about the pivot point final and this can be written because the angular momentum of the uh, ball coming in is just a linear momentum which is mv times this distance which is l times sine of the angle which is 90 degrees so that's just mvl mv naught l coming in now, i'm not going to make any assumptions about the direction of velocity i'm just going to call it v so mvl at the end plus the moment of inertia of the rod times omega that's the rigid body angular momentum of the rod let's call this equation one i should note that i sub p is just a standard moment of inertia entry from your table of moments of inertia it's just one thirds ml squared and we'll put this at the appropriate time the last thing that is conserved is energy courtesy of the word elastic. So the initial kinetic energy of the ball is equal to the final kinetic energy of the ball plus the final rotational kinetic energy of the rod itself. So it's our aim to solve equation 1 and 2. It's two equations, two unknowns. The unknowns are omega and v. But you notice this is a quadratic equation and it's a linear equation. So you, you can foresee some a messy algebra if you don't do something. And there's fortunately a very nice trick that enables you to solve this very nicely. So let's look at equation 1 and transfer over MVL to the other side. When I do that I get M times V naught minus V times L equals I sub P times omega. For equation 2 I'll do the same thing. This time I'll take MV squared over to this side. So I get M V naught squared minus V squared is equal to IP times omega squared. So this can be rewritten by foiling. I can write this as M times 
v naught plus v times v naught minus v is equal to i sub p omega squared and now what I'm going to do is divide this equation by that equation. Dividing equations is a perfectly legitimate way of life. So that's ip times omega. Notice the number of things cancel out. Leaving us with just this beautiful equation. And that's v naught plus v equals, I'll take this l over there, so it becomes omega times l which is a linear equation. So I've replaced this quadratic equation with the help of that, with a sim simple linear equation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve for little v from here, that's omega l minus v naught, and I'll substitute it in equation one. Let's see what I get. That's equation one, so I get m v naught l is equal to m and for v I'm going to put this omega l minus v naught plus i sub p now I'm going to substitute for i sub p it's one third ml squared times omega so let's see one more step I guess I can take the m there's an l outside I forgot that l uh, we can take this m v naught l to the other side so I'm going to get 2 m v naught l is equal to ml squared omega plus one-third ml squared omega. That's a beautiful equation, so I can write this as m plus m over 3 times l squared omega, and now I can immediately solve for omega. Omega is going to be, I'll divide both sides by this bracketed quantity, and I'll take one factor of l out, and then I'll bring the other factor of L down, and I'll get 2m over m plus m over 3 times v naught divided by L. So we have found one half of the answer. We have actually found the initial angular speed of the rod. Now to find the details of the ball are pretty easy. You just have to substitute this omega back in here. So let me do that. V equals omega L minus V naught. Now if I multiply omega by L, I get rid of this L down here. And so I get 2M divided by M plus M over 3. And then I have minus 1, the whole thing times V naught. So let's do this common denominator here. It's 2m minus m minus m over 3 divided by the same denominator, m plus m over 3 times v naught. And uh, that's just 2m minus m is just m. So that's m minus m over 3 divided by m plus m over 3 times v naught really nice looking expression very nice symmetry to it you observe it also tells you something about the direction of the ball uh, imagine this ball is really light and the stick is really heavy so m is going to be less than m over 3 then it certainly is going to rebound because if m is less than m over 3 this you're going to get a negative sign there so I'll write here if m is uh, less than m over 3 rebound. However, if the uh, stick is really light, then if m is bigger than m over 3, in other words, then this ball will just plow through and continue in the same direction. And that direction was x hat. Now, as I said earlier, you can subsequently calculate what the final angle is, but that's just like the previous video, so I won't bother doing that. Instead, I'll spend some time talking about the various limits of these two expressions. What happens in the limit of a really heavy rod? A really heavy rod should be thought of as a wall. So if you put a tennis ball against a wall, you expect the ball to just bounce back and the wall not to move at all. Let's see if that happens. 
the limit of omega as m goes to infinity, what's that going to be? Now, if m goes to infinity, the denominator is going to be very large, so that's going to be 0. Let's try to see what happens if m goes to infinity for this expression. There you have something like infinity over infinity, so you have to use the L'Hopital's rule. So if you differentiate both sides by uh, with respect to m, I'm going to get negative one-thirds divided by positive one-thirds, which is just negative one. So it's negative v naught. So it exactly tells you what I described. The wall doesn't move and the tennis ball rebounds. Let's talk about the other limit. What happens when everything is zero? When m goes to zero, what happens? Now here you expect the, uh, suppose you had a very light balsa stick and the ball you're sending is really heavy shot put or something made of uh, iron. So that's just going to go right through, it's going to plow through the stick and the stick is just going to be sent flying, okay? So you expect the stick to really go fast. Uh, if I put m equals 0 down here, I'm going to get 2m over m, which is just 2. So it's going to be 2 times v0 over l. So that satisfies our expectation, it goes really fast. And then this is limit as um, m goes to 0 of the ball itself. When m goes to 0, I just get m over m, which is 1, so that's just v0. So that satisfies our expectation. Now this part might surprise you. How does it go twice at twice the speed? So I want to propose a little experiment, a thought experiment, and that is the following. Suppose you have a car, and you're sitting in that car and driving at 30 miles per hour, let's say. Let's put some speed there. And you're going along a road that parallels the beach. Okay, some playful kid puts a beach ball right in front of you, in front of the car. Now beach balls are light, so they're not gonna damage the windshield, but what's gonna happen? Well, when you when the car comes there and hits the beach ball, the beach ball is gonna go pretty fast. Now, can the beach ball be going only at 30 at the end? No, because if it goes only at 30, it'll be stuck to the windshield, because you're also going at 30. So uh, it, it's actually gonna go much faster. Now I want to prove to you it's going at 60. So uh, how do I do that? So look at everything from the viewpoint of the driver. The driver inside will not see the car moving because he is inside the car. So uh, he's instead going to see the ball coming towards him at 30 miles an hour, hitting the window and rebounding at 30 miles an hour because the window is a very massive wall as far as that beach ball is concerned. So it's going to come at 30 and leave at 30. Now from the viewpoint of the person standing outside, what they're going to see is the car is going forward at 30 and the beach ball is not going at 30 but at 60. And that's where the 2v0 comes from. Uh, the divided by L part is to convert that uh, linear velocity of the tip. So that's going to be 2v0 in this case and you convert that into angular speed by dividing by the radius. That's how that L comes down there. So those are the two limits, important limits, for this perfectly elastic collision. And I just want to end by saying that this is very rare. Elastic collisions are not real. They never really happen. Think about it. If you had a collision that does not waste any energy, you can't even hear it because if you hear it, it means sound is generated and energy is lost. Actually, you cannot even see the collision because if you can see the collision, it means that some photons from the collision event have reached your camera and the production of those photons will again waste some energy. So these collisions can not only not be heard, they cannot even be seen. So as you can imagine, elastic collisions are almost impossible.